Good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, we are here live coming at you from the Lipa Ratner Museum of Art in Tarpon Springs. Um, joining me tonight is none other than our curator, Christine Arank Carter, um, our collector for the Transatlantic Stitches exhibition. John Singler is joining us in the galleries this evening. And joining us all the way from Singapore is our guest curator of the show, Dr. Stephanie Beck Cohen. Stephanie, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Hey, thanks for having me. We are thrilled that all of you could join us for this engaging gallery talk. Um, we're gonna be enjoying a presentation by Stephanie before we do a live tour of the galleries, um, followed by a question and answer period. So I'm going to ask everybody if you do have questions as we're um, going through the program to please utilize the chat feature. We'll be moderating all of our questions and answers through our chat feature this evening. Well, I am gonna go ahead and share my screen with everybody. Um, and I am going to turn it over to Stephanie to give us some background on this incredible exhibition. Great, thank you, Teresa, for the introduction. And everybody, welcome. So glad you could join us virtually uh, this evening. Um, so I'd like to give you guys an introduction to the exhibit and give you a few things to think about, um, about Liberian quilts before we do the walkthrough and you get to hear from John from the collector himself. Uh, so that the quilts that you'll be seeing tonight uh, were all made in Liberia, West Africa. And the story of Liberian quilts is a story of women, uh, how they take their material culture and traditions with them when they move from place to place, and how they maintain connections and build communities, uh, and how they visually represent the world around them. So to give you a, a sort of briefing, very condensed um, history of Liberia, uh, something that is extraordinarily complex, as you can imagine. Um, I'll just say that uh, uh, a group of free Black men, women, and families left New York City in 1820 and set out to create a new home on the African continent. Um, and you can see here on the map, if you're unfamiliar with what Liberia is, where it is on the African continent it's in West Africa. They landed on the coast of what is today Liberia, encountering both the peoples who already lived there and a new tropical environment. The venture to create a new nation of freed men and women was a contentious idea on both coasts. Once there, however, the settlers kept many of the material traditions of the United States, how they dressed, their architecture, and quilts, among other things. They interacted with the 16 different ethnic groups who lived in Liberia before they arrived, and over time, culture and languages changed for everyone living there. And John can give you a bit more information on that because that is his area of research. The materials used to make quilts, the way they looked and how they were used changed over time as well. And Dr. Singler's collection re reflects these changes as you'll notice as we walk through the exhibit. There were continued influences and connections to the United States and quilters incorporated their everyday experiences as well. We know that Liberian women maintained their connections to their American counterparts through letters and diaries. And one of the ways you can see this um, is in those diaries from the 19th century. And you can see that on the screen, uh, this diary from Anne Lettuce Murdoch, who was an abolitionist in Baltimore, Maryland, um, records that she had sent a package to Liberia along with a letter for her friend Amelia. And in it, she included um, all sorts of material things she thought Amelia could use, soup ladles, collars, knitting needles, um, and of course, quilt squares uh, for piecing her quilts. One of the most prominent ways that Liberian quilts have been used is diplomatically, representing important ideas about the Liberian economy and its people's culture um, in a medium, the quilt, that resonated and continues to resonate with meaning in other places, namely the United States and, um, and Europe. The first and best known diplomatic quilt was made by Martha Ann Erskine Ricks, um, whose picture you see up here on the left, whose father bought her freedom in Tennessee and brought her entire family to Liberia um, in about 1830. Part of a prominent political family, Ricks is famous for quilting a coffee tree in various stages of bloom and presenting it to Queen Victoria during an audience in London in 1892. 
Ostensibly, this gift was meant to thank the, the British Queen for naval assistance uh, that she sent to the fledgling nation early on in its existence, but another possibility lies in its coffee tree imagery. In the 1890s, by the time she presented the quilt, uh, coffee was one of Liberia's primary exports, and Ricks was demonstrating Liberia's readiness to participate in a global economy and culture through the natural resources and Liberia's newly um, established cultured population. The story of the coffee tree quilt spread from the United States to India, as far away as India, through the newspapers. And Queen Victoria traveled the quilt to the Chicago World's Fair in 1893, where millions of people had the opportunity to see it. Um, American Henry McNeil Turner even commissioned a second one to show at the Atlanta um, Cotton States Exposition uh, two years later. And you see that's the middle image here is a photograph from that, ex from that exhibit in the exhibition. You can see that the coffee tree quilt has been hung up over and around um, other material culture from Liberia, um, indigenous woven cloth and a variety of sculpture and other objects. Rix's coffee tree quilt is still made today. That pattern is still done today by Liberian quilters. Um, here's one in the National Museum in Monrovia on the right, and you will see one, a beautiful exhibit, a beautiful version of the coffee tree quilt in the exhibit shortly. Uh, after Rix's audience with the Queen created such a stir, quilts became one of a number of arts that was gifted that were gifted diplomatically over the next century, along with indigenous woven textiles, sculpture, and clothing. Here are a few examples from four different Liberian administrations uh, where we see quilts reaffir reaffirming the historical relationship between Liberians and Americans, as well as Liberian leaders' individual political objectives and messages. So quilts as propaganda, as it were. The quilt on the left was gif gifted in the Oval Office to President John F. Kennedy, and you can see a bunch of the men unfurling it in the site of the Oval Office. It's an unusual place to gift, um, to do, to, to give a dip diplomatic gift. Often these types of objects are exchanged between protocol officers. So a gift unveiled in the White House itself attests to its importance and the pomp and circumstance that surround it. The quilt features the Liberian and American flags reflecting one another, a nod to the Liberian settlers American heritage from the 19th century and the special relationship that existed between the two countries. In 1974, Liberia's First Lady um, also sent Jacqueline Onassis Kennedy a memorial quilt commemorating this meeting, featuring pictures of Presidents Kennedy and Tubman in these um, floral rondels um, to remember this occasion and remember the president. A quilt in the Jimmy Carter collection also features the reflecting flags in a shimmering satin, and that's the one you see here in the middle at the top. Another quilt gifted by first, the First Lady of Liberia, uh, Jewel Howard Taylor, during the Liberian Civil War promotes the idea, promoted the idea of putting the nation's children at the forefront of government policy, which was quite at odds with the conscription of child soldiers during the war by the person serving as the president um, at the time. Bordered by peace doves, it serves as yet another propaganda piece. And the last three quilts here on the right, were gifted to American institutions by President Ellen Johnson Sirleaf. The first features the Liberian seal made out of different commemorative fabrics printed to celebrate Sirleaf's election to the presidency after years of civil war in Liberia. And when you walk through the exhibit, um, you'll see the same green fabric that has been used here in the land and the palm tree of the Liberian seal. You'll see that same fabric used in one of Dr. Singler's quilts as well. Um, and John will see, speak about that soon. The last two quilts were gifted to the Smithsonian's National Museum of African Art. The first quilt conjures up the image of Rix's coffee tr tree quilt again, uh, only it features one of Liberia's other natural resources, iron ore. Um, and the second one reflects the African continent and its 54 countries, which is the mission of the museum itself. The most recent quilt gift from Liberia to the United States was given to Senator Chris Coons when he visited after the recent Ebola epidemic in thanks for the medical infrastructure and help from the American military. So this is an ongoing process of, uh, of quilt diplomacy, soft diplomacy, if you will. 
But Liberian quilts aren't just deployed as diplomatic gifts. Like the quilts you may have at home, these quilts are also used to reinforce relationships, commemorating special occasions and interactions as bed covers and as gifts. Just as quilting here at home captures the artist's everyday experiences and provides a medium for processing the events of their lives, the same goes for Liberian quilters. In my last few minutes, I'd like to show you a variety of the patterns and quilts you'll see in Liberian quilts before you go into the exhibit. A lot of Liberian quilters make applique designs based on the natural world, especially local flora and fauna. Here on the left, you see the breadfruit tree, an example of the breadfruit tree, and then a breadfruit tree quilt that you will see when you walk into the exhibit. Um, and in Liberian quilting, you find both naturalistic patterns as well as more abstract versions, akin to what you might expect from Hawaiian quilts. Um, although in Liberia today, they're generally made from fantastic factory print cloth. You see the coffee tree as well in the middle and a quilt featuring Liberia's national bird, the pepper bird. Um, all right. You'll also find, if we move to the next slide, there we go. You'll also find familiar patterns from American quilt history, like this double tulip pattern in green and brown. Quilts now, quilters now incorporate factory cloth printed in beautiful and elaborate patterns and used all over West Africa into more traditional designs. So you will see um, a lot of the same patterns that you'll find in the United States or Europe. Uh, globally in general, quilters in Liberia have access to quilt pattern books and, um, and the internet. <laughs> so you'll find uh, sort of these more uh, traditional quilt patterns as well as imaginatively um, uh, new ones as well. You'll see more of this fabulous cloth in Aletha DeWalt's African Ladies Quilt, which is at the bottom left, uh, featuring some of the popular fabrics from that season in 2014. And you'll see two, two of her fabulously detailed and meticulously stitched quilts in the exhibit. Quilters also create landscape scenes, including indigenous instruments, masquerade figures, and architecture, like the community building Palaver Hut in the center of Alice Bracewell's quilt. Titled Conflict Resolution, it features indigenous Liberian methods for community rectif rectification of wrongs. Finally, quilters also commemorate historical events in their work. Um, it's kind of like the Social Justice Quilting Network here in the United States, um, which takes on some of the um, more contentious issues of our time through quilting. Gladys Cole's Operation Octopus Quilt commemorates one of the most horrific events of the Liberian Civil War. And the memorial quilt in the center here commemorates the assassination of five missionaries in the same period of war, um, gifted to a religious institution um, to which those missionaries um, had a connection. The quilt on the right commemorates the United Nations Security Resolution 1325, which recognized the impacts of war, especially on women and girls, and it affirmed that peace and security efforts are more effective when women are involved in conflict resolution and recovery efforts. That is, um, that women are integral to building and rebuilding communities, national and international bonds. And this is a message reinforced by Liberian quilters from the individual to the international, and the private to public arenas from the 19th century to the present. So with all those connections in mind, please enjoy the beautiful quilts on display in the museum. Stephanie, thank you so much for that uh, presentation. It's incredible to see the history of these quilts and to understand these connections. And as you said, the soft diplomacy that has existed um, we are going to now join um, our collector, um, Dr. John Singler, as well as our curator here at the Lipa Ratner, Christine Rank Carter. They are in our galleries, um, and so we are going to uh, join them over there. Well, welcome into the galleries for transatlantic stitches. Uh, 
I'm Christine Ray Carter. I'm the curator for Lee Bradner Museum. And we're here with the collector, John Saylor, who flew down all the way from New York City to be with us tonight. Welcome, John. Thank you. It's great to be here. We're happy to have you. I have to tell you, it was quite fun to meet John earlier today when he came into the galleries and was in awe of the installation because living in a small place in New York City, he doesn't get to see his quilts on display or out to enjoy. He has to keep them packed up and maybe folded to the side. So to see them out in full display in all their glories, kind of a kind of a delight for him. So John, welcome. I wanna um I want to get a little bit of insight from you on your background and how you came to Africa and, and what your profession is and tell us about how you started making quilts or I'm sorry collecting quilts. Right. <laughs> sure. Uh, well I grew up in Central Illinois and that's another thing because quilts were a part of my, of my childhood. Um, as an undergraduate I got interested in Africa and one of you in Africa before the undergraduates were in African history. And the way to work that out took me to Sinai County in Nigeria. It's about 200 miles down the coast from the river. Um, and now I didn't end up going on in African history. I was fascinated by the fact that my students spoke English, my good students, they spoke English, I spoke English, we didn't speak the same language. So looking at English and other languages in Nigeria has been my career and has given me a reason to go back. The first year that I was teaching in Greenland, the county sheep, there was a peaceful volunteer who said to me, my landlady makes quilts. You should get her to make a quilt for you. And that's how I got the graduate tree. Um, my first quilt, um, years ago. Uh, but it wasn't just that I, and I am never tired of looking at it, it wasn't just a quilt. We developed a friendship. Um, she, if you live in somebody else's country, you don't have to go by the same rules about who your friends can be and who they can't be. So I would go spend afternoons talking to Olega McGovern, Olega David, term of respect. Now, a couple of years later, my mother came to visit. So I took her to meet Miss McGovern. Miss McGovern was sitting there, she always was, I guess, quilted. And she had a plastic bag next to her. She reached down and presented it to my mother as a welcome gift. And that was this book. So it was a gift that she gave to my mother. Um, and again, it's not one I get tired of looking at. Now, Stephanie talked about the settlers. Sinai was the place really where the settlers didn't get along with everybody else. And they maintained the strongest ties to the U.S. I didn't know that Miss Montgomery's first name was Missouri, because everybody called her Auntie Anne. Already Montgomery, but her name was Missouri Janet Montgomery, which in the late 19th century, Missouri Jane was a, a fad in the US. Well, because I grew up in central Illinois, the airport we used was St. Louis. So the next time I went home, I picked up a cup and saucer in the airport that said Missouri, took it to her, and uh, a man came. She sold bread, and then came to buy bread, and he was a rich rather than a settler. And she said, do you see what this man brought me from our home? Now, her people came in the 1840s. So, in Sino, quilting remained something that only settlers did. And this actually is a good segue to the coffee tree quilt, because this quilt and the one over here are both by Maude Davis. And as Stephanie has pointed out, 
quilting to recognize that quilting came from America, but it's not just something that settlers do. Maud is not herself a settler. You can't look at a quilt and say, oh, that's not a settler. Maud's a spectacular quilter. But this is her rendition of the coffee tree quilt that Martha uh, and Ricks did and presented to Queen Victoria. And it really has now become the best known Liberian quilt because of the revival of interest. But Maud also did this small quilt. And um, the coffee tree quilt is a very good job of a traditional quilt. This is Maud's inspiration. And the cloth commemorates Ellen Johnson Survey's first inauguration in 2006 as the Democratic elected president of Liberia. But what Maud has done with it during the war, um, there was widespread um, displacement during the war. And Maud went to Ghana, there was a, a giant refugee camp. And in Ghana, there's a language of symbols called a dinkle. There are like 64 of them. And this design is one of the adinkra. It's B, we've got a B, but it sort of translates as peace and harmony. Maud had a book of adinkra. You can go online and get the book um, or something like it. And she picked that one out as, um, as reflecting what she hoped to be the president. But notice also how the heads are arranged. This was not just casual sewing. She did it. Now, uh, just an aside on the Dinka, last summer during uh, Black Lives Matter and all of that, in front of the courts in New York City, Black Lives Matter was written on the street. It's still there using a great number of Adinkra. So it's the same Ghanaian thing, but this is the only one I've seen in Liberia, but um, as I say, I'm just impressed. Now I had this for over 10 years before I met Mom. I didn't know, uh, and in fact, we didn't know that she was the one who did it until everyone said that Mom did that. So, um, so that, that's why these two are important. The other quilter whom I know is over here. Um, and I'd like to point this out because this is also breadfruit. Um, this is by a, a quilter of the late Nora Jones. And I asked her, we were corresponding. I was in the area, she was in Louisiana, above Greenville. And I said, I'd like something African. And she didn't really, she, that was sort of a problem until she made it African in the sense of uh, an African tree, which is, um, they're, they're common and they're, I mean, they're common in number, but they have really distinctive leaves. So um, this is one of the, the quilts that um, Nora did. And again, I like it for the design and the, the colors. I just, uh, it's nice to see her again because I haven't <laughs> seen her in a while. Before I moved to a smaller apartment, this quill uh, and that quill and a couple of the others were all on display. So uh, they're the most familiar to me. And uh, again, it uses the breadfruit motif. So it's, uh, it's a reflection of 
of incorporating the local and the new environment, uh, the new environment uh, that affects receptor design. I think the quilting on this is particularly beautiful. Um, so many of them have sort of the diamond shaped pattern and the hand stitching. And here you've got kind of a, a scalloped um, mm -hmm. uh, sort of fishtail look. Do you, John, do you know anything? Or maybe Stephanie knows something more about the, the, the background of the different patterns used for quilting together the fabric. I'd love to know. Because I've never seen a, um, a quilting background like or is she going to say something? <laughs> I can. There, there are about there are usually two different patterns that you'll see um, in the big white spaces of Liberian quilts, and the scallop is one of them. But more commonly, it's the boxes, the diagonal boxes um, that you find in I think almost all of the rest of John's quilts. Um, and then the borders tend to have a triangle shaped pattern. So the waves in the sashing here are a bit unusual as well. Um, but quilters do take license there. There are the secret rebels, if you will. <laughs> um, so you will find a little bit of variation, but the borders generally have a triangular or zigzag design. And you find one of two patterns um, in the large white spaces. I wanted to um, go back to the coffee tree quilt uh, really quickly because one thing I, in, in Stephanie's text, in the wall text, is she talks about the sculptural quality that this particular quilt has. And I think um, Stephanie had mentioned that there's quilting on the top and then on the back side of the quilt uh, to try and give it more dimension. Um, Stephanie, could you talk a little bit more about uh, the making of these more sculptural dimensional quilts? Uh, sure. So uh, the quilting, so the quilting itself goes through all three layers. So you have three layers to a quilt. You have the, um, the top of the quilt and most Liberian quilts are applique. So it's small pieces of cut fabric applied to a background. And then you have the inner filling of the fill of the quilt called the batting. And then you have a back, a large piece of cotton on the back or, lar or several pieces of, um, of, of cotton stitched together to create the back. Um, and as you can see, it even reads over, uh, over the screen how sculptural these are. Um, and that is something that is, uh, that's due to a couple of factors. The first one is how close the, the quilt stitches are together. Um, and then the patterns that are used to create them. So in this quilt, you, you can see there's echo quilting or quilt that, that goes around the pattern um, in these radiating waves. And that gives it um, the part of the sculptural effect. And then something else that, especially in the newer quilts um, that gives it a sculptural effect is just that the batting is much thicker than in older quilts. Um, and that has to do with the materials that are available to stuff the quilts. In the 19th century quilts, you um, there, none of them are extant anymore, but we know from um, letters uh, written back and forth between women that they used uh, kapok or uh, material from the silk cotton tree to stuff the quilts. Um, and then, uh, and then, sort of the early 20th century, you find. Um, that quilts either were, were were coverlets so that they were not stuffed with anything at all, or they were stuffed with very thin um, thin batting, and uh, especially in the second half of the 20th century, but um, even more so uh, since the Liberian Civil War, um, batting is a bit hard to come by for Liberian quilters, so they often will um, take a a comforter or a quilt that was commercially made, open it and reuse the batting from that. So it tends to be a bit fluffier, um, a bit more um, full. So when it's quilted, um, it creates a much more sculptural effect just because it's a bit thicker. Oh, that was way more than I thought we were going to get with that answer. That's fascinating. And uh, certainly in Florida here, I think we can empathize with the, having some thinner bed covers. Um, I think maybe we could tour through the back of the galleries, unless John has something else he'd like to mention about these particular quilts up here. No. no. And I have to say the one thing about John's collection 
which spans about 50 years of collecting and spans the time that he had been in Africa back and forth. It's important to really recognize the uh, significance of having collectors like John preserving uh, these pieces of, of uh, cultural history, even though it's a contemporary history to us, um, for preserving culture during uh, conflict, because these things would have otherwise disappeared. I don't know if maybe Teresa wants to scan through And then we can, I know we're about out of time to um, have some questions answered. And then if anybody has any questions about particular quilts back here, many of these quilts are actually um, by unknown makers, which uh, John has also not only personally been collecting through knowing the quilt makers themselves, but also working with local friends who have acquired pieces for him. Um, and uh, of some of the artists that are in this gallery that we know, we have Alifa DeWalt back here, which um, if you attended our opening reception, uh, Teresa celebrated the colors of the gators, the Florida gators, which John totally picked up on. Um, but it's a beautiful, beautiful pattern. And you can see um, this one is, is from 2007, but the echo stitching in here is really beautiful and uh, absolutely perfect in, in all of its glory in orange and green and blue. Uh, we can maybe just scan over here to capture these quilts. Teresa's doing such a great job. Another quilt by Lisa DeWalt who did the um, tobacco leaf quilt. This is the carnation rose pattern. Again, very, very masterfully stitched and intricate in here. And I know that John had expressed how much he really loves the patterns of this one. And, um, and it's great because this one looks like it combines some of that American traditional quilting um, that, that we're more familiar with. And then of course the, the, local, uh, the local plant life. And another one by Laura Jones, um, another carnation rose tulip. So of the 15 quilts that we have on display in here, we're really representing some of the familiar um, plant life that is in West Africa, but something that also might be familiar to us in Florida. Um, but we've got some really beautiful colors and a variety of techniques to look at. Um, and an unknown quilt with a rectangular pattern, um, which is kind of interesting to see optically when you stand far away, tends to really vibrate. I'd love to see this wearing some 3D glasses, honestly. And I think, should we go sit down? Yeah, we can okay. sit down. And we're actually gonna sit in front of this beautiful quilt that's by an unknown maker. It's a double tulip pattern. And yeah. I was just gonna say that when it comes to questions about stitching and the like, I'm so glad Stephanie is here. <laughs> I got these quilts, just look at them. That's why I got the quilts. <laughs> They're beautiful. I was, and the, the vibrancy of the colors, that's what drew me to them. I mean, I, I can see that the, the stitching is good, but in terms of expertise, that's definitely. Well, thank you, John. That was really good insight and we love the personal stories too. Um, we'd just love to, any other comments from Stephanie are greatly appreciated. Uh, and we can also open it up to some questions. 
Sure. Um, the other thing I would think that is incredibly special about John's collection, not only its breadth and the amount of time that he has spent collecting, is uh, that he has uh, quilts from two different counties in Liberia, from Sino and Montserrano counties, um, which is incredibly special. Um, the only other county that um, has a recorded quilt history is Maryland County, and there just aren't um, that many quilts extant. Um, especially since the Liberian Civil War, unfortunately, um, of these quilts. Um, the Liberian Collections Project um, and Archive at Indiana University has a few photographs um, of quilts, uh, also from probably from Sino County. Um, and yeah, I think just the fact that we have two different geographic regions represented in this collection is incredibly special. Um, American quilters uh, will really identify with this as, um, as often American quilt projects um, are sort of geographically located and celebrated um, to specific states and even counties. Um, so that's, that's another part of the really special um, element of John's collection. I um, noticed something in a previous presentation that you all had done when this, this exhibition, I, we failed to mention, had uh, an iteration of this exhibition had been featured at the International Quilt Museum in Nebraska. Um, and they had a wonderful presentation. And there was um, a comment that I remember hearing about the significance of uh, quilt making for Liberian women in particular um, how important that was because it was um, seeing it as a, as, a, as a business and it was something that, that you did and it was something that women were, were proud of. Um, can you speak a little bit to that and the importance for uh, quilting for Liberian women? Yeah, um, I think this is, it's an important, um, for the quilting families, this is uh, an important source of income. It pays for schooling, it pays for, um, for putting food on the table. Um, and a lot of, uh, a lot of the um, prominent quilters have made it their livelihood. Um, Maude and Alice, Bra uh, Alice Bracewell um, are good friends. They grew up together, although they, they live in two different towns now, um, but they both run, um, quilting programs uh, for younger Liberians. They, they see that teaching younger quilters to quilt, and that's both men and women. Um, Alice, all of Alice's children quilt, the girls and the boys. <laughs> and uh, they all see this as um, a set of essential skills that they can fall back upon um, when they need to um, earn more money or, um, uh, in addition to expressing themselves, it's definitely an important source of income for the families and an important tradition to pass on, something that's, that's sort of an essential skill. One of the things, and this was in the other presentation, one of the young women who was interviewed, I was in Liberia at the beginning of 2019 and 2020 talking with quilters and one young woman said, if you know quilts, man can't rough you. You are not controlled by men. You have your own power. Yeah, I'd absolutely reiterate that, that point. Um, when I, there was a quilter I was um, interviewing and we were sitting on her porch and she, she tapped the wall, the front wall of her house. And she said to me, quilts built this house. So um, that, yeah, it, it speaks to the importance of this, of this skill for these women and their families. Wow, that's, I'm sorry, that like almost brought a tear to my hair. Um, that's amazing. And it speaks to the, you know, art is essential and it comes down to, you know, you have something for yourself and that's, that's all you need in life. Um, I guess I, we could open it up to other questions. I could go on all day, but I, I want to let other people um, share in the fun. Uh, should we have some questions? 
I can, I can answer. Um, Barbara and Alan asked a question uh, in the chat box um, and about their, their time in Liberia in 1964. Um, when, if you lived up country, you did not see them. <laughs> you did not miss them. You did not see them. Um, this is a, a tradition that is um, basically limited to the coast. So, and that's Monserrato County, Sino County in Maryland. That's, that's absolutely correct. Um, because the settlers really didn't live away from the coast. And with the changes in Liberia subsequent to the Civil War, the quilts were seen as too much of just for the settlers. And there are indigenous textile traditions, but the kind of cloth that is woven is by nature heavy. So it doesn't really work for quilting. Now, Ellen Johnson said we had some quilts where the borders use the indigenous cloth, but it's still, um, it does remain uh, a coastal phenomenon. And the current president has not drawn on quilters for um, diplomatic gifts the way all his predecessors do. And it's the politics of it. But yeah, that's, that's absolutely true. That it was, um, they, there were valuable textile traditions, but not like this at all. Are there other questions be between Angela or Stephanie that they've seen in the chat box? I answered this one in the chat box as well, but Barbara had asked um, if the quilts were made by hand or sewing machine. And uh, the answer to that is that they're made by hand. Occasionally the borders, um, all the piecing and appliqueing is done by hand. Occasionally the borders are done um, on a sewing machine, but all of the quilting is done by hand. There are, to my knowledge, no long arm quilters, um, no long arm quilt machines um, in Liberia at all. And all of the quilting is done by hand. And, and I will say there is, um, I think um, this is also an example of the beautiful sort of community minded aspect of quilting. Um, there's a family that um, that I know, and I think Anne-Marie is in this chat, but there's a family um, who have been in Liberia for a very long time. The, um, the, the, um, they were um, uh, nurses and medical professionals and um, they, uh, the, the uh, one woman still, um, her daughter brings her quilt tops um, back to Liberia to be pieced. And um, when her daughter travels um, as part of medical missions to Liberia, um, travels uh, back to the United States, she brings sort of off cuts and scraps um, of factory cloth back to her mom. So her mom can quilt those and create these beautiful tops back in, um, in the United States. <laughs> So um, there's still an element of exchange who still create together. Wow, that's amazing. That's absolutely amazing. And you really, and I have to reiterate, you have to come see this show in person to really understand, um, you know, the, the, the beauty of these pieces and especially some of the more contemporary pieces that do incorporate the, 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 the factory uh, textiles. Um, one that we didn't really touch on uh, was the orange peel quilt that is by Mima Bracewell, but she incorporates a beautiful um, local textile that I personally would love to have an outfit out of. Um, <laughs> So next time, next time you guys are in the period, can you bring back some truck? No, I'm just kidding. Um, but it, it is, it's, a, it's a beautiful exchange that, that uh, is exciting to see what they're doing. It's, it's like contemporary art in so many ways, even though it's, it's based in hundreds of years of tradition. Um, you could put this in any contemporary art museum, just like the quilts from G's Ben. Do we have any other questions? 
Um, Barbara asked who the, who are the customers, who are the patrons of these quilts? Um, yes, they are bought for everyday use. Um, they're used, they're kind of, it's, it's just like in the United States, I would say, where um, they are bought for special occasions, graduations, weddings, um, that sort of thing. Um, you see they're, they're done both on commission and um, you'll see, especially younger quilters, put their quilts up when they finish on Facebook and say, hey, who wants this? Here's the price. <laughs> um, and, that's, and that's something that's specifically to, mostly to the younger quilters. Um, uh, originally, they, um, in, 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 <laughs> in the before times, um, in, um, they were sold a lot at uh, uh, yes, and Marie is reminding me in the chat that funeral memorial quilts are also very important. That's absolutely true. Um, they were sold at big, uh, big sort of fairs and occasions, um, like the U.S. Embassy every year, uh, twice a year had a big um, material culture fair where you could buy them as well. And I think they were also um, sold a lot to Americans um, working in Liberia. Um, there was a network for that. Um, Kathleen Bishop, who was the wife of um, Ambassador Jim Bishop to Liberia um, in the 80s, um, she worked with the quilters um, fairly closely and facilitated a lot of um, their sales. So there have always um, sort of been people, um, uh, Americans who became part of this quilt community um, while they were working in Liberia, who sometimes facilitated these transactions. One thing that has made it different and reduced the domestic market is the economic woes. Um, prior to the 1980s, the Liberian dollar was equivalent to one US dollar. And during the war, that plummeted, and now it's like 150 to one. So, and this really was why I didn't buy, I only got two books in the early 1970s because I was teaching in Liberia on a Liberian salary and when you're getting $175 a month as your salary, you don't buy a lot of books. Now, for that reason, people just don't have the money. Um, there is more of an effort to connect through the internet and the web. So there, there are problems with um, getting the money, transporting it and all of that. But, uh, but yeah, that's, uh, that's a, a part of it. Um, John, there is a question about the war. Um, I'm gonna throw this to you. If you can give sort of a succinct introduction to that. So what's uh, the, the question? question? The question was, when was the war and how long did it last? Okay, the, prior to the war, the settlers had control the government pretty absolutely from independence in 1847 and before that until the military coup in 1980. Um, in, and the settlers were then thrown over by the military coup. Then in 1989, the Civil War began, and it went on for seven years, but it was followed by uh, the election of Charles Taylor, who had been one of the warlords, and the Taylor years were a continuation of tyranny and suffering. So they really routinely talk about 14 years, and they're talking about the period from the war started in 1989 until 2003, when a series of wars during what would be the American summer of 2003 brought the Taylor government down. And it was during that period that everything was turned upside down. And then the Wilton Sumailas studying in 2019 and 2020 had all come from a single community that had been displaced during the war and now lived in other towns. But that's, that's the, the heart of the period. 
1989 to 2003. That's good. We should have started with that context. <laughs> so, uh, That's, uh, I, uh, but it is important to know uh, just how recent when you, when you think about where you were in 1989 and, and uh, what was going on in the US at that time, and what these people had to endure. Do we have any other questions? Hi, Christine, this is Angela. We do have a couple more questions. Uh, this one comes from Sharon Bresson and she's talking about um, what type of uh, storage is required for to preserve the colors of the quilts? Um, I think Stephanie did. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> uh, well, I... Uh, you can talk about how you store them at your house, Sean. Um, do you keep do you keep them in, in um, boxes now, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. So they're stored um, folded in boxes, um, and they come out for exhibitions. Um, and beyond that, are you still keeping some of them hung at home, or are you keeping them all in boxes? They're all in boxes, and in terms of preservation keeping them in boxes, especially if you refold them in the right, is really better for them than having them on the walls of New York City apartments. But they survived beautifully because <laughs> um, they were displayed in your home for a long time um, before we started exhibiting them. You were exhibiting them on, at home. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. But I think the special treatment they get now is that they, they get refolded. <laughs> every so often um, to, to prevent the crease lines. We, we also find, because we have, um, to complement this exhibition, the um, Floridian flavors by the Florida artists who have um, uh, smaller quilts, but because the surfaces have so much work on them, they uh, often have to store them uh, rolled which they roll face out so that the surfaces don't crack. Um, and we tend to, at the museum, we do have a collection of some uh, fine art textiles and of course the Ratner uh, quilts, or oh, sorry, the wool tapestries um, that we keep rolled. And again, those, those are face out so that they, um, the surface is kind of preserved. But, but a lot of times, uh, I've also experienced the local quilters who make the larger size bed quilts also store them folded. And believe it or not, the pillowcase is the perfect transport item for, for bringing, you know, carrying your quilts around. And some ladies who go on long road trips in the RV with their husbands, they put it in a pillowcase and they quilt while the husband's driving the RV. So it seems to be a pretty common, common method of storage. <laughs> Yeah, quilt storage tends to be a matter of um, space and negotiating your space limitations. Um, I also know quilters who have stored their quilts on beds, sort of on top of one another. Um, so yeah, it's a matter of space and negotiating how you can uh, how you can all keep how you can keep these all together. You turn your air conditioning down really low, and then get under all of the quilts and then bed. <laughs> uh, yep. I'm sorry. Uh, all right, Angela asked, how long is the average process to complete a quilt? Um, that is entirely up to <laughs> as many, if any quilters are on this, uh, are on this, um, on this Zoom, <laughs> you will know. It depends on how much time you have. Um, uh, it can take anywhere from um, a week to a couple of weeks to complete a top, depending how detailed it is and, um, and how intricate and how many pieces you have to cut an applique. So something like Maud's um, coffee tree quilt uh, is going to take a couple of months because each of those um, leaves, tiny leaves is individually stitched um, to, to the quilt top. And then the quilting process is usually done by about four women working together. And that will take one to two days generally of everybody working together. 
and teams of four might rotate out too, depending on who's hanging around the house at the time. Do we have any other questions? I know we're almost to the end of the program here. Um, if we have no other questions, we might um, just have our closing remarks, but I'll give you one more chance between or Stephanie, if you see any other uh, comments in the chat. No, nothing? Oh, <laughs> well, it, it, it's been just about an hour. And um, I think that we might be at the end of our program, but certainly you can contact us here at the museum if you, if you do have any other questions. Um, the exhibition will be up through uh, August 29th. And we also encourage you to go see the Dunning Fine Arts Center's uh, quilt exhibitions that are going to open June 18th and will be on view through August 15th. Um, so this will be, this will be uh, all recorded and put on our website. And I just, I, I am so grateful and thankful that Stephanie could be, could join us from uh, the other side of the world. And uh, she's put together an incredible exhibition and uh, we've learned so much today. And I also wanna thank John for coming all this way to see his collection. Um, your depth of knowledge is incredible and the personal relationships you've had with uh, some of these quilters is just unbelievable. Um, I wanna thank Angela too for uh, helping to moderate our administrative side of this program. And thanks to Teresa for being uh, not only the director, but the, the wonderful camera woman that she is. <laughs> so, thank you all so much for joining us and um, we look forward to seeing you again soon.